Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. And um, as always, we want to thank the Jordan Center and especially Sasha Spitalnik for making the 19V series possible. So today we're, we're really excited to have with us um, Catherine Bowers, the University of British Columbia, and Kate Holland of the University of Toronto, who will be presenting their volume, Dostoevsky 200, The Novel in Modernity. And we have two subsidiary, Chloe Papadopoulos of Yale, Robin Foyer Miller of Brandeis. Um, thank you very much. Um, Katya and I are going to do a kind of double act. So um, uh, I will begin, and then Katya will take over, and so on. Um, so the Dostoevsky's 200th birthday fell in the middle of a global pandemic when his birth country was near peak levels of infections and therefore almost all the celebrations ended up taking place over Zoom seems somehow appropriate. That appropriateness comes in part from the fact that Dostoevsky's novels address sudden cataclysmic change. We might remember Toporov's analysis of the number of times the word vdrug appears in Crime and Punishment or the notes to the adolescent which speak of disintegration or the novel itself which Dostoevsky at one point considered calling disorder and in part from the tensions between the atomization of everyone remaining in their own houses and apartments. Social atomization was of course one of Dostoevsky's key complaints about modernity and the overwhelming need to overcome such atomization by making social connections over Zoom that we're now giving this talk about Dostoevsky at 200 at another time of catastrophe when discussions of Russia and modernity are once again taking on world historical significance in the light of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and its monstrous consequences and when Dostoevsky when as Dostoevsky scholars were forced to confront the ugly connotations of the writer's nationalist messianic fantasies and to question how we've approached Russian literature's past and present should also perhaps not be surprising but it's not nonetheless rather discombobulating. I began to think about this volume in 2014, on the one hand very different times, on the other of course as we now all now know Putin's plans for Ukraine were already unfolding. The bicentenary of Dostoevsky's birth in 2021 was on my radar. I'd completed my own monograph, The Novel in the Age of Disintegration, and I was thinking about Dostoevsky and the problem of the novel in modernity uh, from a broad, broader point of view. Katya had come to work in Canada, and we met in Vancouver in 2015 to discuss, discuss plans for how to mark the bicentenary. Given the number of volumes on Dostoevsky and other kinds of discourses, fields, disciplines, we were interested in getting back to thinking about modernity and form, about Dostoevsky's specific contribution to the novel as a genre, and how that con contribution is shaped by a particular experience of modernity. Kate and I have been asking questions about Dostoevsky, the novel, and form in our research since long before we met each other and began to collaborate. Over the years, we noticed that others were focused on these same issues at conferences. At the 2016 ACES conference, for example, we attended panels, and I did look this up for this talk, we attended panels on Dostoevsky and catastrophe, Dostoevsky and rupture, and others, and these were panels that we ourselves had not organized. Our own panel that year was on the epilogue to crime and punishment, concluding our year-long celebration of the novel's 150th anniversary, but also investigating Dostoevsky's engagement with genre, temporality, and their inevitable rupture in our papers. Crime and Punishment is a novel embedded in the crisis of modernity. It's central crime even called by Detective Porfiry Petrovich, quote, a fantastical dark deed, a modern deed, a deed of our time, unquote. That the crisis of modernity would come to the fore in Dostoevsky's works is not surprising. After all, Dostoevsky was writing at a time of remarkable change. He returned to Petersburg from Siberia in 1859 on the eve of the great reforms. This period of social, judicial, economic, administrative, and educational reforms saw the emancipation of the serfs, the advent of jury trials, and the creation of a state treasury and state bank, as well as other changes. Between 1861 and 1874, the reforms led to rapid social and economic growth. At the same time, the publishing industry expanded significantly as a result of the development of a mass circulation press, as well as increased literacy rates. More information circulated to more people than ever before in the Russian Empire. This increase in information flow gave rise to public debates about science, religion, economics, politics, philosophy, and art. 
At the same time, new breakthroughs in the sciences, new theories in economics and politics, and new advancements in the arts engage the growing reading public more quickly and deeply than ever before. The rapid changes in society in the 1860s and 70s were characterized by a public sense of impending crisis, of swift forward motion, but also an impetus to embrace change as a means to further reform state and society. Russia at this time was a society in transition. The changes set into motion by the reforms helped transform literature as well. Deborah Martinson has observed that following the reforms of the 1860s, quote, Russians in the 1870s felt the need to master the new facts of contemporary life and to take a personal stand. Literary genres that dealt with clarifying the relation of self to the outside world, such as confessional novels, diaries, and notebooks, became immensely popular, end quote. Michael Holquist has demonstrated that Dostoevsky's engagement with these genres, his experimentation with form, and his fascination with subjectivity and narrative also emerges from the experience of modernity. And as Kate has argued, this period of crisis is also linked to a crisis of form in Dostoevsky's novels of the 1860s and 70s. Quote, Dostoevsky examines the tempest of modernization, which has fractured society's image into a multiplicity of fragments so that it can no longer be imagined or visualized. The world has taken on a new appearance that can no longer be captured by the old lenses. It requires a new way of seeing, end quote. We initially decided to call our bicentenary volume the novel and modernity because we realized that our central theme is modernity in form. Modernity is the backdrop for all of Dostoevsky's major works. The crises and changes of modernity influenced Dostoevsky's lived and intellectual experiences in innumerable ways, and in so doing shaped not just his thinking, but also his artistic practice. He struggled with how to convey the experience of modernity within the novelistic form, and our research questions coalesced around the way that modernity and the activist representation influenced the novel form itself. Katya and I completed the manuscript for Dostoevsky at 200, the novel in modernity, in the first months of the pandemic, in that strange atmosphere of ever increasing uncertainty about individual, communal and national plans and projects. Many people talked at the time about the pandemic slowing down the collective experience of time. We thought about this as we planned out the introduction for our edited volume, in which we considered how modernity is expressed in Dostoevsky's novels. Our introduction begins with the railway car of the opening scene of The Idiot. We argue that the train is explicitly foregrounded as a symbol of catastrophic modernity, and that it brings into the novel the experience of acceleration, which Reinhard Koselleck has seen as central to the idea of modernity. Lynn Hunt argues that the idea of modernity is a complete break from traditional ideas and values has its root in the Enlightenment and in the French Revolution. The experience of a radical break in temporality expressed most explicitly in the conceptualization of the French Republican calendar can be said to inform the 19th century Russian novel from its beginnings, but it can, becomes much more palpable in the period following the emancipation of the serfs, a moment of rupture perhaps akin to that of the French Revolution in the history of the Russian Empire. Hunt emphasizes the essential core of the concept of modernity as being a new way of experiencing time, invoking Kosselleck's discussion of, quote, the peculiar form of acceleration which characterizes modernity, unquote. Acceleration in Kosselleck's sense, extrapolates Hunt, can be seen as, quote, the constant renewal of the difference between the space of experience and the horizon of expectation, unquote. In other words, there's a rupture between the experience of the past and expectations for the future. As experience and expectation grow further apart, there's an acceleration to try to rush from one to the other. And this sense of acceleration can be found everywhere in Dostoevsky's novels, perhaps most notably in Crime and Punishment, in the rupture of the traditional Bildungsroman structure, as Raskolnikov rejects the path of gradual enrichment over time and embraces the sudden transformation that murder promises to bring, the transformation into a man of action, an extraordinary man. The Idiot is the first of Dostoevsky's novels to so explicitly con contextualize this process of temporal accel acceleration in technological as well as social and philosophical, social philosophical and economic terms. Through the device of Mushkin returning from Switzerland to Petersburg on the train, Dostoevsky stages this moment of rupture between coherent and organized past experience and incoherent and amorphous future possibility as central to the novel that lies ahead. 
Dostoevsky at 200, the novel in modernity, is concerned with the ways in which the particular experience of temporality that encapsulates modernity affects the form of the novel as Dostoevsky conceives it, with the peculiar challenges the form faces as it seeks to convey the acceleration of modern life. What does acceleration mean for the novel? In formal terms, the rupture between past experience and future possibility could be viewed as a problem of genre. Discussing the idiot in his study of apocalyptic fiction, David Bethea argues that the novel's plot centers on the dissonance between Christianity and historicism, between an atemporal ideal and the relentless mar march of Kronos. The train is a significant symbol of the novel's expression of this temporal rupture. As Bethea observes, Dostoevsky embodies these concerns in his art, not only thematically, but structurally. He visualizes the shape of contemporary history, including what he felt to be the critical 1860s, by reincarnating the flesh and blood horse of biblical and folkloric tradition in the horse of modern times, the train. In the beginning, the train serves to connect Mushkin's idealized Swiss idyll with the violent and artificial world of Russian urban society. As the no novel progresses, Mushkin's expected assimilation into this society fails to happen. Instead, the society is drawn into the prince's ethical frame and collapses under its burden. As expectations are thwarted, the novel form accelerates towards an unknown end, the unknowable Obras. In the novel, Hippolyte articulates the anxiety of this apocalypticism when he crucially asks, quote, can one conceive in an image or obras that which has no image? Jackson's formulation of this important question is, quote, with what image, with what sense of form or perfection, inner and outer, can one look at death and disfiguration and still retain one's faith or more generally maintain one's moral, psychological and spiritual integrity? At the heart of this question is the representation of this unknown and unknowable quantity in terms of its form, obras. Faced with the apocalypticism and speed of his present, Dostoevsky recognized his aesthetic and ethical duty to represent this moment, but to do so required new tools of representation and a transformation of the novel form. Choosing which authors to invite for the volume was a challenge. Dostoevsky's studies include so many scholars whose work engages with issues related to modernity after all. But as Kate and I began to plan, we realized that there was a small group of scholars whose current work coalesced around questions of form and especially the novel within its own contemporaneous landscape of ideas. Thus, our volume situates Dostoevsky's formal choices of narrative, plot, genre, characterization, and the novel itself within modernity, that is, within the particular experience of temporality of the post-emancipation moment. We ask how form, narrative, and genre shape Dostoevsky's works, as well as how they influence the way modernity is represented. We were interested in the way form emerges from scientific and philosophical discourse, the way modern life influences employment, characterization, narrative, and genre, and how the experience of modernity led to Dostoevsky's particular engagement with form. I mentioned before that we had originally thought to call the volume the novel and modernity, but we ultimately decided to call it the novel in modernity because we wanted to emphasize that Dostoevsky's novel is a product of and response to the experience of living and thinking within modernity. We were also interested in having the volume as a forum for emerging scholars. Uh, though several of the contributed, contributors had already published one or more monographs, many were still working on their first book as we began work on Dostoevsky at 200. Although several of those books, including Greta Matsnagor's, Vadim Schneider's, Chloe Kitzinger's, and Katya's monographs, are either out, now out or about to come out, so we conceived of the volume as part of a stream of new scholarship de dealing with the questions of modernity in the novel. Now we're going to pivot a bit and start to discuss the individual chapters and different ways that you can read our volume. Um, but before that, I should say that if you're interested in listening to some talks that go deeper into the individual chapters than this one will, um, we did a roundtable in September 2021 on the book um, with our fellow authors, Melissa Fraser and Chloe Kitzinger. And this was part of the bicentenary program we organized. Um, last fall. It features shorter presentations on four of the book's chapters and then a discussion led by Robin Foyer Miller. And if you're interested in that, you can view it on the North American Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky Society YouTube channel. 
When we were planning this talk, we wanted to do something different. We didn't want to focus on just a few of the chapters. We wanted to present the volume as a cohesive whole. As the volume came together, we realized that most of our chapters focus on the major novels. However, peculiarly, only one chapter engages with Brothers Karamazov, um, which if you're a Dostoevsky scholar is strange because Brothers Karamazov is kind of the masterpiece, like the, the apex of Dostoevsky's work. Um, the volume focuses particularly on works that fail to conform to conventional generic categories or frames of expectation because of their hybridic, confusing, or problematic form, especially notes from underground, the idiot, demons, and the adolescent. Together, the volume's chapters cohere to explore the myriad ways Dostoevsky interrogates modernity in the novel form and what these interrogations mean. And now we're going to go through um, e each of the chapters of the volume in turn. Um, so my opening chapter deals with Dostoevsky's gestural poetics, specifically his use of the slap and how it evokes the dual plot and the honor code which underlies it. I trace the function of the slap in Dostoevsky's implotment strategies from notes from underground through demons and the adolescent, showing how slaps reveal the remnants of the romantic dual plot and undermine the romantic models they evoke. I argue that the slap motif and the dual plot play a crucial role in Dostoevsky's late novels, revealing the state of semiotic crisis within which his heroes function. While slaps and duels seem to evoke the fixed values and symbolic meaning-making system of the honor code, in fact, they uncover the semiotic and social ruptures of the post-reform era, revealing the breakdown of the honor code and the lack of any other mutually agreed upon semiotic system. Anna Berman's chapter examines Dostoevsky's complex treatment of the marriage plot, such an important structural core of the 19th century European novel. She suggests that Dostoevsky's marriage plots resist the so-called geneolo genealogical imperative, that they reject the idea of the formation of new family and focus instead on its retention, on the re-establishment of old relations along new lines. Her exploration of Dostoevsky's novel's uh, rejection of the traditional marriage plot finds conceptual support in the idea of queer temporality, an alternative model of futurity which seeks meaning outside of reproduction, in this case in the utopian visions of Ivan returning his ticket, Raskolnikov looking out into the future after his revelation by the river, Prince Mushkin's attempts to convey his ecstatic vision at the Yepanchin's party, and so on. Berman's and my chapters both demonstrate both the conservatism of Dostoevsky's approach to modernity, how he builds on old structures, but also his radicalism, how he turns those structures in on themselves and transforms them. His chapter, Vadim Schneider examines the gendered aspect of Dostoevsky's representation of the changing nature of economic relations in his novels through the figures of two businesswomen, Alyona Ivanovna, the pawnbroker from Crime and Punishment, and Grushenka from Brothers Karamazov. He uses the characters as case studies to illustrate facets of the broader representation of women and monetary systems in Dostoevsky's novels, the way the business women become both economic subjects and objects of forces beyond their control. This is a chapter that demonstrates the way that realism can be challenged by modernity. Melissa Fraser's chapter examines the role of allegory in Dostoevsky's critique of positive science and contextualizes it within a more general late 19th century European movement to do away with the opposition of mind and matter. This movement is encapsulated in George Henry Liu's understanding of dual aspect monism, the idea that the mental and the physical are two perspectives on the same substance and exist in a non-hierarchical relationship. Melissa shows how this dual aspect monism finds expression in crime and punishment as a response to Chernyshevsky's vulgar materialism. In rejecting the opposition between materialism and utopia, she argues, Dostoevsky remakes allegory. Melissa's chapter brings out the richness of Dostoevsky's realism and the ways in which it is shaped by engagement with the scientific discourses of modernity. Alexey Vdovin's chapter shows the in interpenetration of scientific and literary discourses in Dostoevsky's attempts to respond to modernity. He reads notes from underground alongside Sichinov's 1863 influential scientific work, Reflexes of the Brain. 
He shows how the psychology of notes is drawn from contemporary empirical scientific research. Vdovin's work helps to provide context for notes as a boundary work between the earlier, more romantic Dostoevsky and the later psychological Dostoevsky, revealing his engagement with the natural sciences and investment in the polemics surrounding empiricism and evolutionism. Sarah Young examines self and spatiality within Dostoevsky's narrative, mapping the narrative mechanics of senses and embodiment in crime and punishment and the adolescent, particularly hearing and seeing. She shows how through indirect pre presentation, sensory experience and embodiment are related to the margins um, of consciousness and displaced. She argues that in Dostoevsky's poetics, the self can be uncovered only indirectly from the outside. The distortions of sensory perception she examines suggest a kind of proto-modernism in Dostoevsky's novelistic vision. In my chapter, I show how the Gothic informs the poetics of the idiot through the juxtaposition of Holbein's painting, Body of the Dead Christ in the Tomb, and images from the Mazurin murder case that are spread throughout the novel. Using the concept of the Gothic corpse, I demonstrate how Dostoevsky builds affect around character encounters with dead bodies, a practice which allows Dostoevsky to ultimately move beyond the image to engage the reader on an affective level. My chapter considers the challenges that modernity presents to old forms of representation and the way it creates the possibility of new forms. Greta Matzner Gore examines Dostoevsky's interest in the 19th century science of statistics and probability in crime and punishment, and the ways this engagement shapes the novel's narrative. She argues that the novel generates a kind of poetics of probability, predicated in the social statistics work being published in Dostoevsky's time, which she demonstrates informs the novel's methods of characterization, the structure of its individual scenes, and even the improbable ending of the novel, which sees Raskolnikov's moral resurrection. Greta's chapter shows how contemporary discourses penetrate the novel and transform its mode of representation. Another enduring theme in the volume is how new ways of seeing the world within modernity challenge the novelistic, but are then challenged by it in turn. Following Lukács, Bakhtina, and Ivanov, Chloe Kitzinger in her chapter argues that Dostoevsky's characters lack the mimetic qualities of such classic novelistic heroes as those of Tolstoy, that they're less fully fledged, more theoretical entities, idea principles. Focusing on Arkady, the protagonist of The Adolescent, she demonstrates how illegitimacy becomes a model through which Dostoevsky explores new aesthetic and narrative possibilities for the novel within the context of the new pressures of modernity. And she shows how those possibilities threaten the orthodoxies of realism itself, while at the same time creating new mimetic potentialities. Several chapters in the volume address the question of the distinctiveness of the Russian novelistic tradition and the way in which that question dovetails with Dostoevsky's supposed exceptionality within the novelistic tradition. Ilya Klieger's chapter analyzes the differences between the Russian novel as the product of an autocratic society and the Western European novel, the product of liberalizing and democratizing societies. He examines two of Dostoevsky's novels, Crime and Punishment and Demons, as responses to autocratic power and sovereignty in the context of Dostoevsky's own experience with autocratic power in his staged execution. He contends that the novels explore how the symbolic apparatus of sovereignty and power affect questions of identity and the po possibility of action. This allows him to read Raskolnikov's and Stavrogin's crimes in a new way, as sites contested by the symbolic regimes of sovereignty and socialization. He addresses the question of the specific nature of Russian modernity, how it coexists with a mode of autocratic power and its imaginary that belongs to a pre-modern era and helps to explain the peculiarly hybridic nature of the Russian novel. And I really think that Ilya's chapter is probably one of the best places to start um, in Dostoevsky at 200 or even elsewhere um, for thinking about the roots of Russian resistance to modernity and the history of the Russian novel's complicated relationship to the autocratic system.
The chapters speak to one another in many different ways, opening up the ways in which modernity penetrates the form of the Dostoevskian novel on multiple levels and in multiple forms, that it ruptures the old forms, but that out of that break emerges um, something fundamentally new. We organize the volume so that the chapters flow into and build on one another. They progress roughly thematically. However, one of the best aspects of the volume is the way that you can follow different thematic threads through the chapters. In our introduction, we lay out a few pathways uh, to do this throughout the volume, but we thought we'd offer a few others here, focusing on specific aspects of Dostoevsky's novelistic practice. The first of these is genre. Just as Dostoevsky was self-consciously rethinking the boundaries of the novel as a form, so too was he engaged in an interrogation of generic concepts. For Dostoevsky, genre plays an integral role in literary creation, in creating and confounding readerly expectations. It ends up being far more than merely a mode of categorization. Genre becomes a way of looking at the world. Tracing the concept of a genre through the volume's chapters, we see its importance in the way readers' expectations are established and then disrupted in the chapters by Kate and Anna, who look at dual and marriage plots, but consider them in terms of generic forms, as well as in the way engagement with other discourses shapes genre in the chapters by Alexei and Greta, who consider the way narrative is shaped by specific scientific texts, possibly creating hybrid genres. Melissa and I, in our chapters, which consider utopia and Gothic to some degree, both examine the ways that generic convention can be deconstructed to create something new, like a reborn version of allegory or a renewed understanding of Obras and Biazza Brasi. One rich vein within the collection is that of emplotment. Plot provides the framework for the philosophical and aesthetic experiments that Dostoevsky planned in his literary fiction as the expression of what Peter Brooks has called, quote, the design and intention of narrative, unquote. It's a central arena of experimentation for Dostoevsky in an area where modernity is formlessness, but must nonetheless find literary form. Mine, Anna's and Chloe's chapters all examine in different ways the use Dostoevsky makes of old models of emplotment, the dual, the marriage plot, paternity, and how such old models are borrowed, questioned, and endowed with new meaning. Greta's and Katya's chapters show how emplotment engages readerly expectations, how new discourses affect those expectations, whether the science of statistics or the conventions of the Gothic novel creating new kinds of poetics in the process. A plot and emplotment provide the framework. Characterization is the embodiment of the ideas in Dostoevsky's novelistic form, novelistic art rather. In this volume, we are interested in characterization as it relates to form. Chloe uses characterization and specifically Arkady's illegitimacy as a framework to examine, to examine Dostoevsky's realism, its problems and potentialities, demonstrating the central role that characterization can play. Vadim's chapter relies on characterization in his study of Alyona Ivanovna and Grushenka to build the modern economic imaginary that shapes the world of Dostoevsky's novels and many of their characters' interactions. Sarah's chapter considers the way Dostoevsky's characters sensorially experience their world, mapping the ways sensory experience and embodiment interact with space. Sarah illuminates the complex connections between characterization, selfhood, and embodiment in the novel. All three chapters begin with characterization, but each individual chapter considers a different aspect of characterization and form, characterization and mimesis, characterization and the novel's modern imaginary, and characterization as a link to the novel's spatial structure and through it back to the self. Well, perhaps the central theme, though, of the collection is the distinctiveness of Dostoevsky's approach to novelistic narrative and the ways in which his narrative experimentation is shaped by the particular challenges of perception, experience and temporality posed by Russian modernity. Alexei Vdovin's and Melissa Frazier's chapters show how Dostoevsky's narrative is deeply engaged both with contemporary scientific and philosophical discourses and how those discourses are stylized, parodied, hybridized and transformed within the structure of those novels. Ilya's chapter shows how a particular kind of narrative models the presence of sovereign authority in Dostoevsky's novels, curtailing the freedoms we're used to perceiving in the novelistic form, while Chloe's and Greta's reveal the contradictions between the mimetic imperative of realism and the dictates of form and narrative closure. As you can see um, from just these, our volume offers many threads for considering the problem of modernity in Dostoevsky's works. 
If you're interested in reading and engaging more with our chapters, you can find our book on the University of Toronto Press website. You'll notice that its price is kind of high, um, but you'll also notice that under the add to cart button, there's a link to the open access edition. Um, I just wanna draw your attention to it because the text is small, but the link is there. Um, and if you click on that, you will uh, see how to access our text open access. We're glad to have been chosen as one of the three 2021 UTP publications for the University of Toronto Press Open Monograph Series. This is a program sponsored by the University of Toronto Library that makes select UTP books available open access, which means you can download and read the PDF of our volume for free. Um, just go to the website, click on the PDF link under files on the right side, and it will open up for you and you can download it, read it, search it, whatever you want to do with it. In the last few weeks, um, we've been forced to consider Dostoevsky's works in another context, um, that of a war waged because of a Russian nationalist vision of the kind which is never far from Dostoevsky's mind and which we haven't addressed explicitly in Dostoevsky at 200. And obviously, it's kind of early days yet for, um, for, for discussing this, although maybe uh, we could talk about it a little bit in the question period. The volume deals with a crisis of modernity, which has some resonances with the current Russian invasion of Ukraine. Dostoevsky's own ambivalence about the acceleration of life and the supposed ensuing social atomization and fragmentation contain many aspects that speak to some of the reported roots of Putin's justification, the rejection of Europe, concern about a destabilization of traditional values, so-called traditional values, concept of pan-Slavism and so on, concerns that can all be seen in to very varying degrees as responses to um, Russian modernity. Reading Dostoevsky from within his own historical context is important uh, because the darker side of his ideas, such as his recapitulation of Danilevsky's historiography, for instance, are frequently concealed in a universalist interpretation. As we look forward, there are so many ways to read Dostoevsky, so many theoretical and critical approaches. And there's also brilliant scholarship that didn't make it into Dostoevsky at 200, like, for instance, uh, Yuri Corrigan's work on Dostoevsky and philosophy or Alexander Spector's work on narrative and ethics. From the current perspective, it's particularly important to consider not just the novels, but also the mono journal, a writer's diary. Dostoevsky saw this project in terms of form and modernity. It asks the same questions as the novels, uh, but Dostoevsky is much more explicit in his ideas in the writer's diary. And of course, we haven't discussed this um, very much in a Dostoevsky at 200 since it's focused on the novel uh, as a genre. Um, but Lynn Patik's forthcoming book on Dostoevsky's provocateurs is a brilliant treatment of his encyclopedia of provocations. And I, I recommend that everybody um, checks that book out when it uh, comes, I think, out either later this year or next year. Um, from the perspective of the 21st century, it's important to understand why Dostoevsky's works speak to us 200 years later, a phenomenon in part rooted in that ongoing experience of modernity. And a crucial part of our relationship to them is acknowledging the dark side of resistance to modernity. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you both very much, Kate Holland and Catherine Bowers. Um, it's time to turn it over to our subsidiary, and I think we will start with Robin Formiller. Robin, thank you so much. Well, <laughs> this is <laughs> this is a tall order, and I'm going to speak quite briefly and very discontinuously. So um, we will plunge back into the discontinuities of modernism. Um, I, I very much appreciated, Kate, your remarks at the end about the diary of a writer, because uh, I hope maybe that this group will begin to turn its attention to that work, which unwittingly highlights so much of what we were addressing today. And I'm thinking also of the fact that he can, Dostoevsky can say one thing in his journalism and say almost the same thing in a story and we are willing to buy it in the story and we're not so pleased with what he's saying in the journalism, to put it mildly. So um, a few months ago, I had the pleasure of uh, 
vlogging with Kate and Katya on our uh, North American Dostoevsky Society blog. And in that conversation, I began by asking them about modernism and modernity. And I wanted to return to that in a way because your remarks today really um, raise more things that I think it would be interesting to talk about. Um, one thing that they uh, revealed in conversation in, uh, on that blog was that it was basically after they had assembled the chapters that they realized that the, this book is really about Dostoevsky, the novel in modernity and his engagement with modernity. And I found that important because the, the, this engagement with modernity arose organically. It arose organically from all of the wonderful contributions in this book. And I'm so glad you went through the different chapters. But I wondered if we could look at this a little more. Um, so discontinuity, acceleration of time, um, and we all know that, that Dostoevsky's work at the most basic level everywhere has, every atom of it has a positive and a negative charge, and God and the devil, good and evil, beauti the beautiful and the disfigured, time and timelessness, conversion, deconversion, I mean, we can go on and on, to, and it, it what what emerges is this quivering sort of precarious neutrality that is always threatening to decompose, to collapse. Is this the modern, is this Dostoevsky's modernity or is the Dostoevsky's modernity something about how each one of these terms permeates the other? So the, so the other permeates the self, the beautiful, permeates the ugly. It, they, they permeate each other. And um, so then I was trying to think, and I, if any group can address this, I mean, we have Kate and Katya and many of the contributors here and many other um, very, uh, very important thinkers about Dostoevsky. Is there a word that could help to us to encapsulate what we mean when we're thinking about Dostoevsky's modernity. And I noticed the word rupture came up a couple of times. And of course that makes one think of nadriv because that's one of the meanings of it. I, I wish there were a word that I knew of at least in Russian, like the word cleave, which means to break asunder or to cling to within the same word. And I, I don't know, is there, is there a word that we could find? Um, I was very struck by Greta Matzner Gore's article on the, and the different directions that some of the terms she creates um, could take us if we, if we would pursue them statistical fatalism, poetics of probability. These are really uh, rich ideas in thinking about Dostoevsky. Likewise, uh, in Sarah Young's uh, essay where she talks about uh, it, it's deferred senses in distant spaces. They're distorted senses, they're filtered representation through the eyes and ears of witnesses. And of course, as soon as I, encountered that phrase, I, I was plunging myself right back into the Brothers Karamazov. And since your book is focusing much more on all those texts, which really represent uh, modernity and the way that you want, uh, are all thinking about it, I wondered if we as a kind of postscript could think about the Brothers Karamazov a bit, because to me, it seems, although it radiates with this beautiful structure and form uh, that somehow that's, that's a kind of faux covering to a real raging uh, engagement with modernity just under its surface, which is not resolved in any way. I'm thinking, for example, of Jonathan Payne's incredible, I don't know if you've looked at his book, Selling the Story, but at the back, there's this amazing appendix where he shows that there are 38 
retellings of the murder of Fyodor. Um, and if you, if you take that as a starting point and you look at the number of scenarios that Mitya has, the number of scenarios that he enacts, doesn't quite enact, that other people think he has enacted. And then you get to books um, eight and nine and 12 of the novel. And just as much as there is acceleration of time, there is accelerate, there is de there is going backwards in time over and over and over, the same event over and over and over. So you don't, not only are you plunging forward into this judgment that a jury is going to make, but you, you're more and more and more, instead of less and less and less, confused about what happened because there are so many scenarios. And then basic facts that you're supposed to know, you forget. Was the door open? Was the door closed? Was the envelope torn, you know, by who, who tore the envelope? And um, it seems to me that, uh, you know, it, it's wonderful when, when you point out that the, the uh, Kate, that I think it was Kate who pointed it out, that, the, you, that Dostoevsky initially planned to call the adolescent disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's so important. Um, but I think that the disorder that is reigning in the Brothers Karamazov is absolutely uh, massive. And my, my final question is, do you think that Dostoevsky <laughs> struggled against his own quintessential modernity? Um, so many times when he talks about the Middle Ages and the unity and the binding idea, it feels to me like a lie. I, I don't know, but I just wondered this group here, what, what you guys think about that. You know, is he, I'll stop there with that question. Thank you so much, Robin, for those great questions and insights. Um, Chloe, we'll turn to you. Okay, um, so I just want to begin my short comments by saying thank you to 19V and Jordan Center for hosting this event uh, and for inviting me to serve as a Sobisidnik. Thank you also to Kate and Katya for your talk today, but above all, really for the incredible work that you do to promote Dostoevsky studies. Dostoevsky at 200 is just one of the many examples of your collaborative efforts to um, promote um, and make more visible and accessible Dostoevsky studies to bring Dostoevsky scholars together and invite us to use and think more about new methodological approaches to both the kind of so-called Vichni Vaprosi and to historically understudied topics in Slavic studies, including in this volume, the history of science, gender studies, queer theory, the history of economics, and that's just to kind of name a few. Uh, this volume really captures this drive. And in it, we find a collection of essays that embrace really many of the approaches that have shaped the subfield, but that also illuminate exciting paths forward as we read Dostoevsky beyond 200. And as we grapple with the place and ethical imperatives facing Dostoevsky studies and our field today. Um, so my first question, which you already um, kind of begin to hint at in your explanation for the order in which you organize the essays, particularly with um, Ilya's holding kind of the final place is, but that is also potentially fairly un unfairly broad, um, is kind of where do we go from here? Where do we go beyond uh, 200? And uh, I will continue and let, and let that kind of sink in maybe for everyone. I know we're all thinking about it. Um, so the essays in this volume are really united by their author's acute awareness of and interest in Dostoevsky's engagement with modernity, uh, the historical and national specificity and stakes of which you, Kate and Katya, so concisely and really effectively uh, describe in your introductions consideration of the train and the idiot as a symbol of forward moving chaotic Russian modernity. You point to the tension between kinetic modernity and the kind of timeless still 
it all between seemingly a seemingly kind of ceaseless movement forward of the reform era and the stillness of life outside of history. History, which was so kind of palpably uh, present during the massive moment of social, economic upheaval on which your volume focuses, the, the great reforms. And the space between these two oppositional poles, this kind of amorphous in-betweenness motivates so much of the drama and momentum of Dostoevsky's works, which show us the ambiguity of a present that is in some ways completely divested of presentness, um, so to speak, uh, an absence that Kate, uh, you once described to me as the absence that is at the heart of demons. And um, this volume's engagement with modernity and with Dostoevsky's rootedness in the contemporary moment is what allows its contributors to really venture beyond the text into history as it were. Now, I guess what really excites me about um, your engagement with modernity as it's developing and represented during the era of reform is its propensity to encompass what we think of today as major moments in, um, as major moments in Imperial Russia's cultural development, as well as the moments that fall out of history as we kind of think of it today. Um, in the same way that you say that the idiot opens out onto time, so too does this volume in so many ways. Um, in a more concrete way, it really exposes its reader to a particular moment in history when artists were actively grappling with their relationship to time and their understanding of Russian national identity. At the same time that Dostoevsky is writing, many of the works that are analyzed in this book, for example, there is kind of just putting it very simply and hopefully quickly, uh, a revived interest in the pre-modern past, which proved to be a useful tool for some uh, for grappling with the uncertain present of the reform era. We see, for example, historical fiction re-emerging as a popular form after around a 30-year hiatus, um, especially early on in the 60s. Uh, historical painting and sculpture likewise come to occupy a prominent and very specific place in the increasingly realist landscape of the visual and plastic arts. And in historiography, new works treating the pre-modern period appear in more and more accessible forms. And then Dostoevsky, for his part, publishes a number of works of historical literature treating both the Russian and European medieval past. For example, in 1862, he serially published the first Russian translation of Victor Hugo's Notre Dame de Paris in Vremia. And in 1864 and 1865, he published works depicting the Russian pre-modern past by the little known author of popular histories and historical fiction, Nikolai Chayev in Epocha. And so I guess my closing questions for you, which are far more specific uh, than my previous question are how did Dostoevsky's own works respond to the present through consideration of the historical past? So we talked a little about the writer's diary and journalism. And I think that his relationship to history and Russia's kind of teleological potentially uh, trajectory or not um, emerges in his journalism, um, but kind of how do we think of it within the context of the novel and particularly the form and structure in which we find so many of these novels that are produced during uh, the, the period uh, under, under kind of examination in, in the book. Um, how does pre-modern inflect his vision of the modern? And in this vein, what does the space in between kind of this chaotic modernity and timeless timelessness look like across Dostoevsky's work of this period? Is there kind of a consistent vision that you see elaborated across these articles? Or is this something that is really being worked out along the way and that we might be able to trace from volume to volume, so to speak? Um, and then how can we situate Dostoevsky's response to the reforms within broader cultural trends or more and more minor cultural production? And how can this really help us to reevaluate our prevailing narratives of greatness vis-a-vis -vis the 19th century canon? And so I'm gonna end my comments there, but obviously feel free to answer any or none of those questions. And again, just thank you uh, for this wonderful work. And also thank you to the contributors as well, many of whom I know are uh, here today. 
Thank you, Chloe. Um, we'll go back to to Kate and Katya. Thank you so much for all of these questions. This is great. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the brothers Karamazov. I guess let's start with Robin and Kate. Feel free to interrupt me if you would like to add on to this. Sure. Um, so I I really appreciate your comments about the brothers Karamazov, Robin. And I have to say that it wasn't like a deliberate idea that we would not include the brothers Karamazov here. We asked people to contribute and allowed them to pick whatever they wanted to talk about. And it just happened that we got one chapter that was partially on brothers Karamazov and the other chapters didn't really engage with it. Um, and we found that really curious when we, when we uh, started assembling the chapters and thinking about um, through our introduction, thinking about how how to uh, kind of think through the conversation that the chapters seem to be having with one another. Um, and you're right that the the brothers Karamazov, this was what we decided about it, that because it's it seems on the surface to not be as, for lack of a better word, messy as Dostoevsky's other works, um, because it does have this beautiful structure and form because it was so well planned, it does seem like, um, Dostoevsky's what I like to call Dostoevsky's themes, like the the way that he constructs narrative, isn't quite so apparent in the Brothers Karamazov. Um, one of the reasons why I really love the Idiot is because you can almost kind of see the way that Dostoevsky is working things out. And in his notebooks, at one point, when he's written about half of the novel, he's like, "I need the plot. The plot is necessary to continue." And I'm like, Dostoevsky, what are you doing? Right? How do you how have you written half of this novel with no plot? Um, but of course, that's that's Dostoevsky, right? The unplanned and messy Dostoevsky. And with Brothers Karamazov, I think you're right that it's it's like a false cover, like a pretty cover that conceals um, Dostoevsky's grappling with modernity and this this kind of like raging chaos behind it. Um, and I, I noticed this as I teach Brothers Karamazov every year, and I've just finished teaching Brothers Karamazov last week, and my students, <laughs> This increased confusion, basic facts, facts are forgotten and slip away. This is exactly my students' experience of reading through the novel uh, to the point that at the end, when, when we get to like the end of part nine, there's, or we get to the end of book nine, they're asking me all of these very basic questions about the plot that are coming up in the trial. And my answer is always, does it matter? Does it matter if the door is open or closed? Like part of the point is that you're not supposed to remember or you're not supposed to know. And how can we know if the door is open or closed? But what I find really striking about the Brothers Karamazov is the way that Dostoevsky manages to undo all of these systems that are supposed to be the organizing principles of modern, so-called modern life, right? So the reforms bring us um, a new trial system and Dostoevsky looks at that trial system and he kind of interrogates it. And at the base of it, there isn't a structure, right? That that structure is missing. And it's, you know, Kate talks about, and Anne Lansbury's article also on demons, talk about kind of the emptiness at the center of demons. But at the Brothers Karamazov, there's also an emptiness. And that emptiness is in this, the, the lack of supposed structure of all of these things that are supposed to give structure to the chaos and change that's happening around Dostoevsky. So I think that I, I really appreciate your comments. And I think if we're going to, uh, if we're going to take Chloe's question, where do we go from here? One of the places we could go is looking at the Brothers Karamazov. But I also have to say that when we started thinking about our introduction for this, one of the places we went first was to the edited volume, A New Word on the Brothers Karamazov. And I, it follows on a number of other volumes on the Brothers Karamazov. Um, and it's a wonderful edited volume. And it um, in the introduction to that, Robert Louis Jackson compares the Brothers Karamazov to Chartres Cathedral and like its beauty and its form. Um, but I think if we if we look at kind of what's under that, the, the kind of gaping inside where you have to project meaning onto things yourself um, and where beliefs are tested, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, and and just to go along with that, also the I mean, of course, the empty center of the Brothers Karamazov is the set of ellipses. Um, the where where the murder takes place, but we are never actually informed um, what what happened in that moment. And so I think that there's still that that in a way breaks the breaks the the sort of perfect form of the novel in a way that um, uh, makes a kind of um, a, a vision of modernity possible even within within that novel um, too. 
Could I just respond super quickly to this? Because just recently I've been aware in the Brothers Karamazov, I mean, picking up exactly on the point, Katya, that, that you're making and, and you, Kate, that, for example, the sentence, you did not murder him, is uttered three times, once by yep. Alyosha, twice by Smirnikov. And once Alyosha is uttering it to Ivan to say you're not guilty, and both times the intonation from Smerdyakov, the exact same sentence is to say, you are guilty. And so, uh, and, and at the beginning of, of the trial, the narrator chronicler tells us as he's about to give us the account of the trial, some things I did not hear, others I did not notice, and others I have forgotten. And I have literally no time or space to mention everything that was said or done. <laughs> so I just, you know, the form is beautiful and it's encasing a kind of chaos. Yeah, and I think that um, Smerdyakov is also really important here oh, too. Um, and and I think that, you know, recent treatments of Smerdyakov by Anna Berman and by Chloe Kitzinger in their books um, have really kind of helped to complicate. Yes. And all the um, Nearsen in the past, yes. Yeah, yes. yes. Um, although I still, um, um, I think, still want to insist that um, the Brothers Karamazov is nonetheless still a work where Dostoevsky's uh, impulse towards um, kind of um, blocking the rupture of modernity through form, um, it dominates rather than the collapse. Um, and I think that whereas obviously in the adolescent, it's the collapse that dominates. And you were Absolutely. asking for a, for a word, and I think that the the word that would kind of bring those two impulses together. I don't think I, I have a word, but I just wanted to, a very important word, I think that I've always found central to this process is razlaginia, right? Disintegration and sort of, and then of course also the idea of obras trapped inside yeah. the word biazabrazia, which of course, yeah. um, That's which of course- I was thinking too, yeah. Bob Jackson is of course yeah. um, the, the, the the master of that um, uh, concept. Um, and then, and um, in terms of, um, of Chloe, the, the question about um, uh, hi history and sort of the looking back to the medieval is, I think, really important here um, in terms and especially in terms of um, where to go now with Dostoevsky in the current um, in our current crisis. I think one huge problem is the um, the idea of kind of looking back to a unified past, um, and of course this uni this 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 kind of illusory unified Ruth, right? This illusory unified um, entity that at some point, you know, in Dostoevsky's, because of course his historiography becomes instead some kind of um, a vision, a, a sort of biblical vision, right, or a kind of mythological uh, model rather than a historiographic model. Um, but I think to me, one of the most exciting directions that Dostoevsky scholarship could go is in unearthing, um, he, he's so fascinated by historiography. Um, and I mentioned Danilevsky, I think Danilevsky is key to some of the more problematic um, ideas in demons. Um, and I think that um, a, a lot more analysis of the historiography of the period within which Dostoevsky's novels are kind of located and against which they are um, um, kind of debating and engaged with um, would be a really good direction uh, to go in. Um, let's see what other, um, I mean, one, just to sort of one personal direction that Katya and I are going in in our own work is that some of you may know that we're now working on a digital Dostoevsky project. And in that we're interested in, um, in computational text analysis. So in which allows us to kind of go rather than doing a sort of broad reading of um, 19th century Russian literature, what our version of text analysis does is it kind of goes deep into the structure of Dostoevsky's novels. So um, by doing things like um, marking particular instances of liminality in um, the double, for instance, that's one thing we're interested in. Um, we're, we're able to kind of go on a, on a sort of deeper level um, and sort of find um, the, the really sort of, um, I guess, the deep structural seams of the text. So that's, that's one thing that we're interested in. Um, and then also another example that was mentioned is 
is um, is is the problem of the present, right? And I think you brought this up, Chloe, right? That that in a way, Dostoevsky's kind of unified past uh, in demons sort of moves straight into, or or there is kind of the problem of presentness, right? There's the problem of sort of a lack of presentness in demons, or a completely can, kind of chaotic version of presentness. And then of course there's the utopian slash dystopian future, right? And so one thing that I'm really interested in in that novel is marking um, what's how much of that novel actually relates to the novelistic present and how much of it actually relates to the prehistory of the plot and how much of it relates to the future. And so through computational text analysis and through marking particular verbs and so on, this is something that Katya and I are hoping to do soon, um, we'll be able to see actually how much of that novel actually takes place in the present um, and, and sort of where, where present tenses kind of shift into uh, conditionals or, or um, subjunctives or other kind of realms beyond the novelistic present. And my gut tells me that it's a lot. Um. Definitely a lot. <laughs> I think I think we're going to find that the majority of the novel does not take place during the novel. Yeah, but, exactly. Yeah. Thank you both. Um, we can open the floor up to discussion now. I'm just going to put in the chat our um, website for Digital Dostoevsky in case any of you are curious to see how we're coming along with that. Our blog is slightly behind where we are, but there are some records of what we're doing there. <laughs> I, I thought to ask another question that didn't fit well into my comments. It's not necessarily a question. I'd just like to hear a little bit more about it, I suppose, because so in the introduction, as, as I kind of alluded to, you talk about the way in which uh, the idiot kind of plays with time, let's say, um, in particular in the scene, uh, in the opening scene on the train. But one of the scenes that has always been kind of, I think, on my mind when I'm thinking about time is, is the moment that Mushkin breaks the vase. Yeah. Uh, and the way that it just excruciatingly time slows down in this in this yep. really palpable way where you want it to speed up because you don't want to be watching what is unfolding right now because it's horrendous. Yeah. Um, and so I wondered kind of what you think about the way in which uh, in particular times change during that scene intersects with some of the, uh, let's say, content of the scene, the, the, the topic under discussion uh that that kind of unfolds i mean this obviously isn't necessarily related to the to the book uh overall more so kind of the introduction and some of the themes discussed in it but i would just if you have any thoughts on it that 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 might loop into what we're talking about i would love to hear yeah yeah i mean i think that here you can see the sort of epileptic temporality um you know the sort of that that strange space between the aura um, in and his kind of vision of some kind of a in his head it all makes sense right and then the sort of um, the difficulty of articulating that within this social context right there's a little bit of an of a, um, a dream of a ridiculous man moment there too right but at the same time it's also um, I think that there's a connection here between epileptic temporality and apocalyptic temporality um, and the idea of sort of the the rupture of time that the that the French Revolution brings, right? That that it sort of breaks the chronology um, uh, in a way that also makes possible um, modernity, right? Or kind of kind of breaks open modernity in a way, right? And that um, the um, uh, the also within that kind of apocalyptic aspect of the French Revolution, there still is for Dostoevsky some kind of a potentiality that he, as a former revolutionary, cannot quite quite abdicate, right? I think that's what's so fascinating about Dostoevsky and modernity is how, you know, on the one hand, yes, as a conservative, you know, there are all these things that are collapsing, there are all these things that is disintegrating, but at the same time, he can never, like the, the sheer possibility for him as a kind of, a, as an artist is just never muted, you know? I see that, I or when I, when I read The Idiot, I read that scene with the breaking of the vase as a, I'm not sure whether to call it like a reflection, an echo, like a 
a mirror image almost of the scene where <laughs> Lebedev interrupts Mushkin's birthday party to go off on his rant about cannibalistic monks. And yep. then that rant is interrupted by Ippolite coming in and launching into his essential explanation. Yep. And I think that that, that I mean, Lebedev talking about the apocalypse, the unifying idea, the cannibalistic monks, like it's ridiculous. <laughs> it and is. As Robin pointed out, um, these this idea of the unifying idea, the characters that have this in their mouth, they're always raving, they're socially unacceptable, they're doing awkward things in social uh, moments, or they're, they're, in the case of Raskolnikov, they're sick in prison with some kind of brain fever, right? They're, they're not exactly um, lucid characters, and they're usually mid-rant when, when this idea of the unifying idea comes up, right? And so Lebeziatnikov, or not Lebeziatnikov, I'm, I'm mixing my L characters, Lebedev, um, if Lebeziatnikov was in The Idiot, that would be a very different novel. Um, Lebedev in The Idiot, when he's making this rant, he, he gets to the point, but he gets there via these ridiculous kind of roots. And when he's interrupted by Ippolit, Ippolit gets right down to the seriousness and Ippolit then introduces Dostoevsky's main idea in the novel, which is this idea of seeds and growth and this idea that he carries out, this idea that Dostoevsky carries through his, his later novels, right? The, the way that we can transform the world through universal brotherhood. This idea is very serious, just like Mushkin's ideas pre- fit are very serious in that scene with the broken base, but they are disrupted, broken, like it, it, almost you can't take them seriously because of the way that then the, the conversation shifts with his fit with that, that rupture. Yep. Um, and it's, it's really interesting too, when you consider that scene, because although Mushkin has said all these things, he said exactly what he wanted to say from the beginning and he finally gets it out. And not one of the characters in that scene will remember it because all they will remember is the awkwardness, the horror, the, the, the way that scene ended. And the same with, um, the, the same with Ippolite, like he gets out what he wants to say, but because it is framed by these two very yep. awkward social situations, the misfire of the gun and the, the talk about cannibalistic monks and how they're eating all of these babies and whatever, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of hidden, concealed within the novel, right? The, the, yeah. The bright ideas don't really have the opportunity to grow for the characters that hear them in the novels. Yeah, and also kind of as Alison Tapp, I think, points out in her great article on mm -hmm. The Idiot, that's also, I think, one of the ultimate scenes of the social novel being also kind of infused with the metaphysical in a way that's like deeply and profoundly inappropriate, um, but also, you know, highly Dostoevskyan, right? Yeah. So we have a couple of questions. Um, First, we have a question from Jenny Flaherty. Jenny, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, I really enjoyed hearing about the volume. Um, I have been thinking throughout the conversation, um, and this goes back a point to you raised, Robin, about you know, is how how much are sort of are we taking from Dostoevsky? And I, so I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, modernity seems bad right? Chaos, rupture, disintegration, or even if it's not bad, it's chaos. Yeah. And I'm wondering, um, is it right? I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, there's a view, like, let's say, let's say from radical enlightenment that actually, because reason accounts for everything, and it ought to account for everything, modernity in that capacity is quite clear. It's quite clear, it's quite stabilizing. Um, or from the other end, modernity could be actually quite ordered and quite normative, whether in its bourgeois or in its absolutist varieties. Um, and so I, I guess I'm wondering what is what then is Dostoevsky doing to generate this idea of modernity as chaotic? You know, and as, as you said um, just a moment ago, Kate, right, there are sort of different political varieties within that possibility yep. versus um, conservatism. But I'm wondering about the, the, the idea of its chaotic nature in general, um, right? Like, where does that come from? Is that something that Dostoevsky is, is building? You know, and I think it relates to, um, you know, just modes of interpretation as well, right? That, that this is something hard to capture, this yeah. thing that is modernity. 
Yes. So how do we then put representation on it? But again, just just a kind of thought experiment. Is it right? Is it hard to capture? Um, but but what it, what is the sort of effect that's created through yeah. representation by this the sense that it is? Um, so so that's I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Well, I I would say that the key to this I think the key to this question is is the adolescent. Um, and, you know, I think that, you know, we sort of, um, and I think Chloe Kitson does a brilliant job in her work on the adolescent, and which sort of builds on other, um, other kind of reassessments of the adolescent, right? And so, in a way, sort of Dostoevsky's um, calling that novel um, um, yes, periodic, right? Um, that, I mean, initially, initially, it kind of, you know, comes from that. I mean, of course, that's the whole kind of inversion of progress, right? The Dostoevsky, in, its, in a way, historiography is kind of that of a kind of critique of progress that sees it almost a kind of precursor to degeneration, right? As, as everything is somehow kind of falling apart, right? But at the same time, um, it, his his skill as an artist is it is within that portrayal of chaos, right? So he may not, you know, he may feel that frustration in the in you know his own kind of statements about his art. But actually, I mean, I think that that Padrostek does offer an alternative vision of modernity in which actually everything is fairly ordered by the end, you know, and the, actually it's the beginning of a new kind of novel, you know, and in a way, um, you know, that's the only novel in a way that has a sort of a, a, a work, a strange workable marriage plot at the end right and that or at least that plot which seems so perverse right the the alliance of the sort of the the um I guess the relationship of Versilov and Sofia that has produced this kind of messed up adolescent that he, by the end of that novel, turns out exactly to be the kind of hero who's important, right? But Dostoevsky doesn't have the courage of his convictions, right? Because he has to go and then write and then write the Brothers Karamazov and is back to the same old criticism of, of modernity, right? I think the thing to remember, I think that the, well, the way that I read this is that in chaos and in rupture, there is always potentiality. And I think Dostoevsky sees this too. Um, and I think every time you have some kind of rupture in his novels or some kind of expression of that chaos, there's always, it, he always kind of uh, has something come out of it, something new emerges from that rupture. Um, and even in the examples that we were talking about before um, in The Idiot, Yes, that those those ruptures they're like fissures that open up in the novel, but they they enable. And here I'm partially relying on Connor Doak's um, queer reading of the idiot. They're fissures that enable uh, these new ideas of Dostoevsky's to sprout forward. New ideas that allow Dostoevsky to to sort of order his world in some way. Um, one thing I wanted to point out which is maybe a very obvious thing to point out, is that Dostoevsky, so Dostoevsky comes back in 1859, 1860, and he hasn't really been in European Russia since 1849. And so he himself is coming out of this rupture. And Russia in 1860 is a different place. Like European Russia and the kind of intellectual discourse that he had been a part of, had been engaging in, is a very different place than it was in 1849. The ideas are completely different. A lot of the things have moved along. There are a lot of these kind of new ideas coming in. And I think he, like experiencing that, he himself experienced an acceleration of time that I think he found quite destabilizing um, coming back from that, that life experience. And I think this then gets reflected in a lot of his works. And you can see this, the, the way that he engages with new ideas of science and the way he kind of interrogates them and he interrogates them in ways that don't necessarily rely on all of the scientific discourse that he's missed they rely on the scientific discourse that he's picked up on and kind of stepped into upon his return. So for him, time did accelerate and it accelerated upon his return when he suddenly got all these, what was like plunked into all of these discourses that had been going on without him for a decade. And it looks like we have a question from Robin. Robin, you can go ahead and, and unmute uh, yeah, yourself. Yeah, I just wanted to comment quickly. I mean, the word rupture is popping up again and chaos. And Jennifer, the, those remarks were so interesting. And I, I was thinking about chaos and how out of chaos, in fact, and the kind of chaos that 
or disorder that you're apprehending, Katya and Kate and others in the volume, um, can evolve into chaos theory uh, in an interesting way and into the notion of fractals. And that that might be interesting to think about chaos theory and fractals in relationship to Dostoevsky and modernity. And I don't quite know how or what exactly I mean, but I kind of think there might be something there. Um, I, it's, it's sort of, um, um, uh, Jenny sort of asked my question in a way, but um, so if, if there is uh, somebody in line after me, then we can move on. If not, I can try to go at that question again. <laughs> slightly differently. So Sash, is there, is there other people behind me? I don't believe there's anyone behind you unless I've missed well, anyone. I will give it a try. I, I'm not sure if it will come out very differently, <laughs> but, okay. but I sort of wonder if we can, uh, and, and I like your, your, your answers, Kate, Kate and Katya, but, but I wonder if there's also another way of framing the question and maybe another set of answers as a result. First of all, I just wanted to thank you guys for the volume and for and for your your presentation, and uh, and Robin and uh, Chloe as well for for your um, responses. So the question, I guess, that one one of the ways in which uh, and Jenny said this pretty much, one of the ways in which uh, people talk about modernity is in terms of um, uh, uh, among other things, is in terms of uh, extreme orderliness, right? So. Uh, Faber calls, talks about the iron cage of modernity, right? Uh, there are, there is uh, association of modernity with rationality, right? Descartes' very well-known idea that mathematics will make us into masters and possessors of nature, right? Uh, so stuff like that. In other words, uh, um, D, um, sort of D, depriving uh, existing reality of uh, uh, flattening existing reality to the point at which it just becomes time and space, a uh, flat time and space, a Cartesian grid into which we can then impose uh, all sorts of uh, arrangements or, and rearrangements, right? Seeing like the state or what, however we want to imagine. So, right, and so, and okay. And then we have this, um, this notion that in Dostoevsky disorder is primary Right, disorder is a primary category of modernity. But we do have in Dostoevsky as well the other version, in particular Notes from Underground, uh, I think, right, the idea that, uh, and, and throughout, I think, the idea that there's a kind of uh, ordering, um, uh, a kind of ordering, uh, almost, a, um, you know, I don't know if I want to say hubristic, but overweening kind of attempt to impose order onto the world that, that uh, resists it. Is, so is, is it worth talking at all about the, the kind of dynamics of, of order and disorder in Dostoevsky? Not, not so much in the, according to um, the way that, you know, uh, or, disorder is modern and order is pre-modern, but in terms of the way in which both of these are in fact modern, both of these are in fact products of modernity. And in fact, both of them are entangled with each other and rely on each other, right? And if we recognize that, then we can also, um, yeah, then I think we can also, yeah, sorry, Kate, you, you, you have an answer. No, I was gonna say that I think, and, and I think it really kind of goes back to the, to the crisis of, the, of what he, or the, the duality with which he views the Petrine origins, right? The Petrine reforms, that for him, those are both um, kind of the fall right or part of the like part, like the moment the moment at which you know the fall takes place right because it's the sort of um the um intelligentsia and the aristocracy kind of move forward while the, while the narod stay behind um but at the same time it's also that which allows for everything which um you know in fact for his own social estate to exist right in a way right so and i think that there are moments so in the 1860s you get more 
um, kind of there, there's more of a sense of the possibilities offered by the Petrine order, right? So, um, but I think that as you move into the 1870s, you have to look further beneath, or you have to sort of read him against himself to find to find that, right? But uh, but I do I I. I I think I need to think more about it, but um, certainly I don't think that, you know, I, I absolutely agree that these two things are, um, you know, that they that they engage with each other or that, that one sort of is is embroiled in some kind of a struggle with the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that this idea of order and disorder uh, as being intrinsically linked together and as being inextricable or in it, in it not inextricable, inseparable almost within Dostoevsky's works. I think this is another of these these ones that Robin set up in her her discussion, like right how things permeate each other. The other permeates the self. The beautiful permeates the ugly. Disorder permeates order, but order also permeates disorder. Like you can't have disorder without order, right? It's an organizing principle, and I think. Yeah, yeah sorry, sorry, I, sorry. I totally agree. I need to think about it more. Cleaving, says Robin. <laughs> Bye, Robin. Cleaving. Thanks yeah. so much. No, we, I, by the way, I forgot to say thank you um, before when I when I launched into my talk. So thank you so much to Sarah, especially, but also all to the rest of the organizing committee and, and especially also to uh, Robin and to Chloe. Thank you so much. I was saying cleaving, but I do have to leave. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Uh, you can't have cleaving without leaving. Um, <laughs> Greta has a question. She says she wants to say something to an answer to Jenny's question as well. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, I was I was just thinking about that question. How does Dostoevsky right? Is modernity actually fractured? And how does you know? It, it, clearly, it is fractured in Dostoevsky's novels. And how does he? Um, sort of create at, at least the illusion that this is an accurate picture of, of reality. I mean, I realized that I had accepted just wholeheartedly <laughs> that the 1870s was um, a chaotic time period, maybe because I've spent too much time reading Dostoevsky. But um, I was also thinking about uh, uh, the diary of a writer and he spends so much time in diary of writer talking about the chaos of, of modernity and the chaos of the current moment. That's how he opens diary of a writer is continually um, repeated and returned to in his nonfiction. So in a way, it's as if I, I think maybe partly an answer to Jenny's questions, he sort of creates the nonfictional reality in his journalism and then returns to it again in his fiction. So they kind of feed into each other. Um, and it creates this really, I think, strong realism illusion, at, at least for me, it did. I, and, I, and I didn't even realize how much so until you asked that question. Thank you very much for a fantastic discussion. Um, unless I see any other hands, I'll just congratulate Kate and Catherine again on the wonderful volume and a great year of Dostoevsky celebrations. And thank you to both of our sub too for, um, for the really wonderful questions. Um, it's, been, it's been a great year for Dostoevsky, great couple of years for Dostoevsky. Thank you, thank you everyone.